Lesson 9 To Serve and to Save Sabbath Afternoon February 20 John the Baptist recalled the prophecy concerning the Messiah. Jehovah hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the year of Jehovah's favor, and to comfort all that mourn. Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2, American Revised Version. Jesus of Nazareth was the promised one. The evidence of his divinity was seen in his ministry to the needs of suffering humanity. His glory was shown in his condescension to our low estate. The works of Christ not only declared him to be the Messiah, but showed in what manner his kingdom was to be established. To John was opened the same truth that had come to Elijah in the desert, when a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, God spoke to the prophet by a still, small voice. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. So Jesus was to do his work, not by the overturning of thrones and kingdoms, not with pomp and outward display, but through speaking to the hearts of men by a life of mercy and self-sacrifice. The Ministry of Healing, pages 35 and 36. In his life, no self-assertion was to be mingled. The homage which the world gives to position, to wealth, and to talent was to be foreign to the Son of God. None of the means that men employ to win allegiance or to command homage was the Messiah to use. His utter renunciation of self was foreshadowed in the words, He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. In marked contrast to the teachers of his day was the Savior to conduct himself among men. In his life, no noisy disputation, no ostentatious worship, no act to gain applause was ever to be witnessed. The Messiah was to be hidden God, and God was to be revealed in the character of his Son. Without a knowledge of God, humanity would be eternally lost. Without divine help, men and women would sink lower and lower. Life and power must be imparted by him who made the world. Man's necessities could be met in no other way. Prophets and Kings, pages 692 and 693. Christ saw the work of the priests and rulers, the very ones who needed help, the afflicted, the distressed, were treated with words of censure and rebuke, and he forbore to speak any word that would break the feeble reed. The dimly burning wick of faith and hope he would encourage and not quench. He would feed his flock like a shepherd. He would gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1146. Sunday, February 21 Servant Nation To the prophet Isaiah was given a revelation of the beneficent design of God in scattering impenitent Judah among the nations of earth. My people shall know my name, the Lord declared. They shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 6 and not only were they themselves to learn the lesson of obedience and trust, in their places of exile they were also to impart to others a knowledge of the living God. Many from among the sons of the strangers were to learn to love him as their creator and their redeemer. They were to begin the observance of his holy Sabbath day as a memorial of his creative power. And when he should make bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations to deliver his people from captivity, all the ends of the earth should see of the salvation of God. Verse 10. Many of these converts from heathenism would wish to unite themselves fully with the Israelites and accompany them on the return journey to Judea. None of these were to say, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Isaiah chapter 56 verse 3. 
for the word of God through his prophet to those who should yield themselves to him and observe his law was that they should thenceforth be numbered among spiritual Israel, his church on earth. Prophets and Kings, pages 371 and 372. Christ has made every provision that his church shall be a transformed body, illumined with the light of the world, possessing the glory of Emmanuel. It is his purpose that every Christian shall be surrounded with a spiritual atmosphere of light and peace. He desires that we shall reveal his own joy in our lives. At his second coming, the redeemed from among men will receive their promised inheritance. Thus God's purpose for Israel will meet with literal fulfillment. That which God purposes, man is powerless to disannul. Even amid the working of evil, God's purposes have been moving steadily forward to their accomplishment. It was thus with the house of Israel throughout the history of the divided monarchy. It is thus with spiritual Israel today. Prophets and Kings, page 720. Christ taught his disciples precious lessons in regard to the necessity of trusting in God. These lessons were designed to encourage the children of God through all ages, and they have come down to our time full of instruction and comfort. We cannot but look forward to new perplexities in the coming conflict, but we may look on what is past as well as on what is to come and say, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 25. The trial will not exceed the strength that shall be given us to bear it. And by and by the gates of heaven will be thrown open to admit God's children, and from the lips of the King of glory the benediction will fall on their ears like richest music. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew chapter 25 verse 34. Steps to Christ, pages 123, 125, and 126. Monday, February 22. Unnamed Individual Servant When we want a deep problem to study, let us fix our minds on the most marvelous thing that ever took place in earth or heaven, the incarnation of the Son of God. God gave His Son to die for sinful human beings a death of ignominy and shame. He who was commander in the heavenly courts laid aside His royal robe and kingly crown and clothing His divinity with humanity came to this world to stand at the head of the human race as the pattern man. He humbled Himself to suffer with the race, to be afflicted in all their afflictions. The Son of God came voluntarily to accomplish the work of atonement. There was no obligatory yoke upon him, for he was independent and above all law. The angels, as God's intelligent messengers, were under the yoke of obligation. No personal sacrifice of theirs could atone for fallen man. Christ alone was free from the claims of the law to undertake the redemption of the sinful race. He had power to lay down his life and to take it up again. Being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 904. As the high priest laid aside his pontifical dress and officiated in the white linen dress of a common priest, so Christ emptied himself and took the form of a servant and offered sacrifice, himself the priest, himself the victim. As the high priest, after performing his service in the Holy of Holies, came forth to the waiting congregation in his pontifical robes, so Christ will come the second time clothed in glorious garments of the whitest white, such as no fuller on earth can whiten them. He will come in his own glory and in the glory of his Father, as King of kings and Lord of lords, and all the angelic host will escort him on his way. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, pages 1111 and 1112. Christ has entered the world as Satan's destroyer and the redeemer of the captives bound by his power. He would leave an example in his own victorious life for man to follow and overcome the temptations of Satan. 
As soon as Christ entered the wilderness of temptation, his visage changed. The weight of the sins of the world was pressing his soul, and his countenance expressed unutterable sorrow, a depth of anguish that fallen man had never realized. He felt the overwhelming tide of woe that deluged the world. He realized the strength of indulged appetite and of unholy passion that controlled the world, which had brought upon man inexpressible suffering. As man could not, in his human strength, resist the power of Satan's temptations, Jesus volunteered to undertake the work and bear the burden for man and overcome the power of appetite in his behalf. Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 271 and 272. Tuesday, February 23. Persian Messiah The great waymarks of truth, showing us our bearings in prophetic history, are to be carefully guarded, lest they be torn down and replaced with theories that would bring confusion rather than genuine light. There have been one and another who in studying their Bibles thought they discovered great light and new theories, but these have not been correct. The Scripture is all true. But by misapplying the scripture, men arrive at wrong conclusions. We are engaged in a mighty conflict, and it will become more close and determined as we near the final struggle. We have a sleepless adversary, and he is constantly at work upon human minds that have not had a personal experience in the teachings of the people of God for the past 50 years. Those who are seeking to understand this message will not be led by the Lord to make an application of the word that will undermine the foundation and remove the pillars of the faith that has made Seventh-day Adventists what they are today. The truths that have been unfolding in their order as we have advanced along the line of prophecy revealed in the word of God are truth, sacred eternal truth today. Selected Messages, Book 2, pages 101 to 103. The Lord has resources. His hand is on the machinery. When the time came for his temple to be rebuilt, he moved upon Cyrus as his agent to discern the prophecies concerning himself and to grant the Jewish people their liberty. And more, Cyrus furnished them the necessary facilities for rebuilding the temple of the Lord. This work began under Cyrus, and his successor carried on the work begun. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1175. In the unexpected entry of the army of the Persian conqueror into the heart of the Babylonian capital by way of the channel of the river whose waters had been turned aside and through the inner gates that in careless security had been left open and unprotected, the Jews had abundant evidence of the literal fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy concerning the sudden overthrow of their oppressors. And this should have been to them an unmistakable sign that God was shaping the affairs of nations in their behalf. For inseparably linked with the prophecy outlining the manner of Babylon's capture and fall were the words, Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 28 and chapter 45 verse 13. Prophets and Kings, page 552. Wednesday, February 24. Hope in Advance. How shall a man be just with God? How shall the sinner be made righteous? It is only through Christ that we can be brought into harmony with God, with holiness. But how are we to come to Christ? Many are asking the same question as did the multitude on the day of Pentecost, when convicted of sin they cried out, What shall we do? The first word of Peter's answer was, Repent. Acts chapter 2 verses 37 and 38. At another time, shortly after, he said, Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repentance includes sorrow for sin 
and a turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in the life. Steps to Christ, page 23. The true penitent does not put his past sins from his remembrance. He does not, as soon as he has obtained peace, grow unconcerned in regard to the mistakes he has made. He thinks of those who have been led into evil by his course and tries in every possible way to lead them back into the true path. The clearer the light that he has entered into, the stronger is his desire to set the feet of others in the right way. He does not gloss over his wayward course, making his wrong a light thing, but lifts the danger signal that others may take warning. We should learn that in watchfulness and prayer is the only safety for both young and old. Security does not lie in exalted position and great privileges. One may for many years have enjoyed a genuine Christian experience, but he is still exposed to Satan's attacks. In the battle with inward sin and outward temptation, even the wise and powerful Solomon was vanquished. His failure teaches us that whatever a man's intellectual qualities may be, and however faithfully he may have served God in the past, he can never with safety trust in his own wisdom and integrity. Prophets and Kings, pages 78 and 82. I testify to my brethren and sisters that the Church of Christ, enfeebled and defective as it may be, is the only object on earth on which he bestows his supreme regard. While he extends to all the world his invitation to come to him and be saved, he commissions his angels to render divine help to every soul that cometh to him in repentance and contrition, and he comes personally by his Holy Spirit into the midst of his church. Let this be our language from hearts that respond to the great goodness and love of God to us as a people and to us individually. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Consider, my brethren and sisters, that the Lord has a people, a chosen people, His church, to be His own, His own fortress, which He holds in a sin-stricken, revolted world. And He intended that no authority should be known in it, no laws be acknowledged by it, but His own. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, pages 15 and 16. Thursday, February 25, A Feeling and Suffering Servant In the later centuries of Israel's history prior to the First Advent, it was generally understood that the coming of the Messiah was referred to in the prophecy, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. It was to Christ that the prophetic promise was given, Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth. Thus saith the Lord, I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, Go forth, to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them, for he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 7 to 10. Prophets and Kings, pages 688 and 689. As the world's Redeemer, Christ was constantly confronted with apparent failure. He, the messenger of mercy to our world, seemed to do little of the work he longed to do in uplifting and saving. Satanic influences were constantly working to oppose his way, but he would not be discouraged. Upon the promises in God's word, Jesus rested, and he gave Satan no advantage. When the last steps of Christ's humiliation were to be taken, when the deepest sorrow was closing about his soul, he said to his disciples, The prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. The prince of this world is judged. Now shall he be cast out. John chapter 14, verse 30, chapter 16, verse 11, and chapter 12, verse 31. The Desire of Ages, pages 678 and 679. 
In every trial we have strong consolation. Is not our Savior touched with the feeling of our infirmities? Has He not been tempted in all points like as we are? And has He not invited us to take every trial and perplexity to Him? Then let us not make ourselves miserable over tomorrow's burdens. Bravely and cheerfully carry the burdens of today. Today's trust and faith we must have, but we are not asked to live more than a day at a time. He who gives strength for today will give strength for tomorrow. Nothing wounds the soul like the sharp darts of unbelief. When trial comes, as it will, do not worry or complain. Silence in the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. Then are they glad because they be quiet. Psalm 107 verse 30. Remember that underneath you are the everlasting arms. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Psalm 37 verse 7. He is guiding you into a harbor of gracious experience. In Heavenly Places, page 269. For further reading, Lift Him Up, In the School of Christ, page 162, and Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, Precious Words of Warning and Promise, pages 126 and 127.